All right. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. It's afternoon already. The time passes by very quickly at these kind of events. Uh, welcome to my session about LOCKI. Uh, so LOCKI is a new acronym uh, introduced by the Open Infra Foundation that stands for Linux, OpenStack, Kubernetes, and Infrastructure. For those of you who missed the uh, morning keynotes, uh, my name is Titus Kurek. I'm a product manager at Kaunical. And um, uh, my background is product management, obviously, but it's also data center administration, including a bunch of data center technology, uh, obviously Linux, OpenStack, Kubernetes, but many, many other, also Ceph, you know, OVN, observability, and stuff like that. So I'm going to start by showing this mem. I'm pretty sure you've seen it before. Uh, it's very popular in the internet. I can say two things about this mem. So first of all, it's funny. <laughs> Second of all, uh, it kind of very well reflects the mentality of some people who are, who are still in the process of the digital migration. So obviously, when cloud technologies came in many, many years ago, uh, organizations embraced them, and uh, they were hoping that you know, by moving all of their workloads to the cloud, they're going to solve all the issues that they've been facing with their infrastructure. But they forgot so that, you know, but lifting and shifting workloads from the legacy IT infrastructure to the cloud is, is not how you do it, right? So they realized very quickly that they need to introduce cloud native concepts. So they started exploring uh, technologies like Kubernetes and, and cloud native. Uh, but they also kind of embraced them and like started, you know, uh, now we have to move to Kubernetes entirely, right? Uh, this is not how you do it. But uh, this kind of created a tension between OpenStack and Kubernetes communities uh, for a while. So everyone who was originally involved in OpenStack development and also from the operator perspective uh, was kind of looking at Kubernetes like, well, really, do we have to migrate to Kubernetes now? We've just completed the migration to OpenStack, right? And on the other hand, everyone who's got involved in Kubernetes, either from the developer or operator perspective, started looking at OpenStack as something like, well, we're not really going to need OpenStack. It's going to be fully Kubernetes moving on. The truth is that the reality lies, as always, somewhere in the middle. So in fact, according to the OpenStack user server results from 2021, 70% of organizations report integration activities between OpenStack and Kubernetes. And I'm pretty sure if a similar survey would be run across the Kubernetes crowd, the results would be similar, obviously unless someone would be using Kubernetes in public clouds. But when using on-prem, I'm pretty sure 70% of organizations would respond, yes, we integrated with either VMware, OpenStack, or any other uh, cloud platform that we're using, cloud stack maybe, maybe. Uh, so this trend falls very well under this new acronym LOCKI, that stands for Linux OpenStack Kubernetes as three primary technologies that are needed to implement an open infrastructure, right? And if you think about it, uh, 20 years ago when web applications were kind of at top of what people were doing in the IT space, uh, there was this acronym called LAMP, which meant Linux, Apache, um, MySQL and PHP, as you know, four technologies needed to implement web applications. Now it's Loki. That means those are really the three technologies that we're going to need to implement an open infrastructure. So you need Linux, you need OpenStack, you need Kubernetes, and that's it. So in terms of uh, you know, various integration activities between OpenStack and Kubernetes, I'm going to focus on two use cases. So first of all, Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. That's the most common one, right? So obviously, OpenStack was initially designed as a cloud platform. It was designed as an open source implementation of AWS EC2 service. And this is why it's coming with a built-in multi-tenancy capabilities. Kubernetes was not designed by that, for that. So obviously, you can get multi-tenancy in Kubernetes by using sort of a hackery, but it doesn't come with integrated multi-tenancy capabilities. By running multiple Kubernetes clusters on top of OpenStack in separate tenants, you get multi-tenancy with Kubernetes. It also provides better performance thanks to various extensions that are available in OpenStack. 
So if you think about GPUs, for example, there's you know, NVIDIA vGPU technology that allows virtualization of GPU resources. You can attach them to instances running on top of OpenStack and expose them to containers that would be running on top of Kubernetes that would be running on top of instances on top of OpenStack, right? Uh, it also provides proper load balancing capabilities with OpenStack Octavia, which is a proper layer free load balancer, uh, and access to a variety of storage and identity plugins that have been supported in OpenStack for years, right? So if you think about it, you know, the number of plugins for the OpenStack Cinder service is, is like, it's very huge, right? So a lot of storage providers have contributed a bunch of plugins to OpenStack for years. Those might not be available in Kubernetes yet for any given reason, right? So by using OpenStack underneath, it helps you to access all of those st uh, storage and identity plugins. But there's also another use case that a lot of organizations have been exploring for years now. It's uh, OpenStack on Kubernetes. That also comes with a number of benefits, right? So first of all, better isolation of OpenStack services. By putting OpenStack services inside of containers and running them you know, on top of Kubernetes, uh, each uh, control plane service is fully isolated. Uh, also, a number of lifecycle management capabilities in Kubernetes is, is rich, you know, including all of those rolling upgrades, auto-scaling, and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, it helps to standardize on a single platform across, across both applications and infrastructure. So this is how we do Loki on Ubuntu, right? We leverage the best of breed technologies that are available on the market. We use mass. Metal as a service for bare metal provisioning. It's an open source project that's maintained by Canonical. We obviously use OpenStack because there's nothing better in the open source space for infrastructure as a service platform. We use Kubernetes because there's no better container orchestration platform. And we can either run it on top of OpenStack or directly on a bare metal. And we use Juju, which is an operator lifecycle manager that uses chummed operators for the purpose of you know, streamlined delivery and operations of applications on top of the Loki stack. And there are chunked operators for a variety of most popular open source applications, including Postgres, Kafka, OSM, Kubeflow, MongoDB, and many, many, many other. And when it comes to various flavors of Loki on Ubuntu, we have Loki for production, uh, which uses uh, Chumped OpenStack and Chumped Kubernetes distributions uh, that are fully open source as well. Uh, they allow for composable, configurable deployments of Loki uh, on top of Ubuntu. They provide lifecycle management capabilities and can be deployed at any scale. Uh, and this kind of a Loki stack is used by a variety of organizations all over the world right now. It's used for AML purposes. It's used for the purpose of building a local public cloud infrastructure. It's used by a variety of research institutions, including universities. And recently, it started being used for high-performance computing use cases as well. If you would like to learn more about Loki for production on Ubuntu, visit us at the booth B11. We have a demo there today at 4 PM, where we're going to showcase how we deploy Charmed OpenStack and Charmed Kubernetes and run Kubeflow on top of it and leverage various, you know, these kind of integration capabilities between OpenStack and Kubernetes. But in the remaining part of this session, I'm going to focus on something else, Loki for development. So since some of you are developers or DevOps engineers or, you know, site reliability engineers, you would be probably wondering how you can actually try all of those technologies together, how to get started with Loki on Ubuntu. So I'm going to introduce you to another distributions of both OpenStack and Kubernetes, MicroStack and MicroCades, that provide an opinionated OpenStack and Kubernetes capabilities inside of a snap, uh, come with super straightforward installation instructions, are lightweight, meaning that you can run them even on your workstations during this event, providing an on-rails experience with both OpenStack and Kubernetes. And on that part, I'm going to move to the demo. So I'm going to switch to the terminal window uh, and uh, log into 
my instance on AWS, uh, where I started setting up my Loki stack, but I tested that on my workstation as well, so you should be able to repeat. Uh, it doesn't need to run on the AWS. Uh, so this is where I have MicroStack already installed. Uh, oops. Here we go. Uh, so I've got my you know, OpenStack in a snap uh, installed there. That's fully functional OpenStack. Uh, it comes with you know, two installation commands that are really needed to run it. And uh, I have a Juju client installed over here. And as you can see, I've already added OpenStack, the MicroStack cloud, uh, to my Juju client so that I can start uh, deploying workloads on top of it. I've already bootstrapped a controller. It's called Locky Controller. It runs uh, on the top of the OpenStack cloud. I created a model that's again called OpenStack. And I've got one instance deployed there. It's called Microcade. So using chunked operators, I deployed a fully functional Kubernetes cluster on top of OpenStack, which in my case is MicroStack, right? So this is how it looks like from the OpenStack point of view. I'm pretty sure this command looks more familiar to some of you. Right, so I have two instances running on top of MicroStack. Uh, one is the Juju controller, and the other one is my uh, MicroKate instance. So that's my Kubernetes cluster. And now I'm going to deploy Postgres. I'm going to deploy it as an instance on top of uh, MicroStack. And we can run a juju status command inside of a watch loop to see how it's going. So as you can see, it's already started uh, provisioning uh, an instance. But it's going to take a while. It needs to create a virtual machine. It needs to place a charmed operator over there and start. Um, well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, it's going to retry. Uh, no need to worry right now. Uh, so at the same time, uh, in parallel, I'm going to uh, I'm going to log in from a second terminal window and uh, right. So it's still creating this uh, instance. Uh, I'm going to add. Uh, Kubernetes uh, as another cloud to my Juju client. Right? Uh, and deploy Mattermost here. So I'm going to deploy Mattermost uh, using charmed operators uh, as, uh, as a pod running on top of Kubernetes. And they'll use a database that's provided by Postgres, which is running as an instance on OpenStack. So as you can see, it's already started uh, deploying the Mattermost unit, but uh, very quickly it's going to hand on the waiting status because uh, it needs a database relation. Like uh, Mattermost cannot exist with a database. So it's waiting for the database to be offered by the Postgres service. So, uh, in the next steps, uh, I'm going to create uh, security groups that will allow me to access my Postgres instance.
So I need to create a security group called Postgres and then enable a traffic uh, to the Postgres uh, port, which is uh, 5432. and finally attach it to the instance itself. And to grab the instance ID, obviously. Okay, so at that time, I, at that point, I should be able to access my Postgres instance uh, at the uh, Postgres port. Uh, so in the next step, uh, I'm going to SSH to my uh, Postgres uh, instance. Uh, first, I need to switch to my OpenStack model. This is where I have all the virtual machines deployed. Um, so SSH to the Postgres instance. And we can have a look at the Postgres configuration files. Obviously, sudo. So as you can see, there are some settings written there by Juju already, but uh, this access list is pretty empty because we haven't really uh, connected that to the, we haven't integrated that with the Mattermost application yet. Uh, so in the next step, uh, I'm going to create an offer. So I'm creating an offer to the Postgres database interface that will allow me to connect my uh, Mattermost application running on top of Kubernetes to my Postgres instance running on top of uh, OpenStack. And to find the floating IP address of my uh, microcase instance. And now I can add a relation between Mattermost and the Postgres database interface that runs in a separate model on the OpenStack cloud. Need to connect them via the floating IP address of the microcase instance. So it's executing, right? Like you can see the agent is executing, meaning that uh, the charmed operator is uh, performing a, a job on both the Postgres and Mermos side. And having a look at the Postgres configuration file, you can see that uh, access lists have already been written by there, by the charmed operator in a fully automated way. And now uh, I can log into my um, microcades instance and have a look at how all of those things look from the Kubernetes point of view. So I'm going to SSH to my microcades uh, instance. Yeah, and uh, I can list namespaces. As you can see, there is a Kubernetes namespace created here, which represents the name of my uh, Juju model running on top of Kubernetes. Uh, I can list uh, pods. As you can see, there are three pods created there. One is for the application itself, and the other two are for the operator. So in the next step, I'm going to get like an exact name of the uh, application, and I'll establish a port forward to it so that I would be able to access it from the instance running on AWS. This is where the whole Loki stack runs. So 
So we see Kubernetes. So the same uh, uh, that you know in the middle everything has got deployed uh, and it's in the active state, uh, including both the Postgres and Meromos application. You on yeah. Right, so that's the name of the uh, pod. Need to set up a port forward. So it's running in the background, and at that stage, I should be able to access my Mattermost application uh, using a web browser running on my AWS Loki instance. Here we go. So that's pretty much it in terms of the demo. Uh, that's a Loki for development. Uh, if you would like to test it, I would encourage you to uh, Follow the instructions we've prepared for you. Uh, there's a tutorial uh, that describes you know, all the steps required to set up Loki for development on Ubuntu. And uh, if you would like to see a Loki for production, uh, I would encourage you to come to our booth uh, at 4 today. We're going to have a demo of Charmed OpenStack with Charmed Kubernetes running on the top and Kubeflow as a sample application. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, do you have any questions? Does it? We'll solve that. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. Sorry, I cannot hear. If, if you come closer, maybe you know. <laughs> yes. Is it a single deployment or what? It's a single pod. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention.